protists, similarly radial areas, diatoms, the uh, algae, coccoliths like the cal calcareous algae like coccoliths and dinoflagellates and ostracods, the arthropods. So all of them uh, are studied uh, under the branch micropaleontology and these are very important as I mentioned earlier for uh, in the exploration of hydrocarbons because these help you in understanding the environment in which the sediments were deposited. If you know the environment of deposition, then you can anticipate the presence of uh, the hydrocarbons within the uh, those environments. Certain environments like the marine, shallow marine environments are suitable for the formation of uh, uh, marine, uh, the hydrocarbons, uh, which mainly form from the, uh, uh, the source of these uh, hydrocarbons is mainly from the organic material. So from that, you can actually, using these microfossils, you can act, you, know, you can determine the environment. And so we can interpret or actually see whether there are any hydrocarbons in these sediments. And also, correlation of the two, one already known hydrocarbon basin with, with a unknown basin. If this, they have the same kind of fossils, you can actually correlate them. Then there are kinds of uh, fossils which are known as exceptional preservations or lysostat deposits. And these are uh, basically uh, fossils which are preserved under certain uh, exceptional conditions. Like these ones, mostly the, uh, the frozen uh, skeletons of the mammoths. Mammoths are the extinct uh, relatives of the modern elephants and they lived uh, during the Pleistocene time and they became extinct uh, uh, around uh, 11,000 years ago. And this, uh, uh, these skeletons are found in the Siberian tundra and in most of these areas, uh, lots of these fossils are found. And you can see, in fact, the preservation is so good you can see the flesh, you can see the blood, the color of the blood, and also the skin uh, uh, is preserved. So this uh, is uh, uh, frozen skeletons are the most uh, useful ones for even, in fact, some people are trying to uh, even extract the uh, DNA from, from these uh, frozen skeletons. And then we have the fossils in amber. Amber fossils are generally produced uh, in areas where the resin producing plants. So like most of the uh, uh, plants in uh, temperate regions, coniferous trees, for example, when there is any damage to the plant, then they release the resin. And this resin, when it falls down, and it in, in a short period of time, it will solidify. So this resin, uh, uh, like uh, many of the animals, small animals like the insects, arthropods, and uh, the uh, small animals like the frogs, etc., they get preserved uh, in the resin intact. So, in, in fact, the basic theme for the Jurassic Park is that a mosquito bites a dinosaur and it sucks the blood of dinosaur, and then this mosquito gets entombed in amber. And later, the scientists uh, find this mosquito and they extract the DNA of the dinosaur from the uh, uh, mosquito's blood and that is how the dinosaurs were created. This is what was the theme for the uh, Jurassic Park. But uh, that is, uh, uh, at the moment it is not possible, but it's a, a film. And so we have several such animals like the spiders, uh, lizards, frogs, insects, and many of them are found, and most of them are found in the southern part of the Europe, in the Baltic Sea area, and in India we have a, a place called uh, uh, Vastan. Uh, Vastan is a, a lignite mine, uh, and here you can find a lot of resin within the lignite, and this resin contains many species. In fact, recently about 50 species of arthropods have been reported from this uh, resin. Then there are, like you have seen earlier, some of the plants, they uh, are preserved in erect position like this one, and you can see the uh, uh, roots uh, still preserved. And then there are cases where uh, you can see the uh, crustaceans uh, in the sediments. This is, in fact, it comes from India, from Barme, where we have the fuller set. Fuller set is nothing but uh, the so-called Multani Mitti. So there uh, you'll find lots of these uh, fossils, the 
intact fossils like gastropod, fishes, etc., in the uh, fuller's earth. And then, in some cases, the even the color of the shell of the ammonite is preserved as it is. And uh, this is, of course, a, a very exceptional preservation of the. I, I think most of you know that this is the Archaeopteryx, the first known bird. And if you remove these feathers, uh, it will not be considered as a bird because in all the other an anatomical features, it is more closer to the dinosaurs. And in fact, the, it's only the toes in the uh, limbs and the feathers which bring them closer to the dinosaurs. So this is, a, in fact, a transitional uh, fossil between reptiles and the birds. Then there are cases where uh, uh, even a skin of a dinosaur was formed, impression of the skin was found in the rocks, like this is the uh, Cretaceous duckbill dinosaur from Monta Montana. And then in, in certain cases, even the gill filaments of the fish, they were preserved. So like this is the modern gill filament, and this is a fossil filament from Cretaceous rocks of uh, uh, Brazil. So uh, these uh, kinds of preservations are possible only in cases where the conditions are not uh, oxic only in anoxic conditions because aerobic bacteria decompose most of the body, the soft uh, parts of the animal. So it's only the reducing environment in which no such bacteria exists. And so the decomposition process is slowed down. So that is how they get preserved. Then, uh, sorry. So there are uh, a number of trace fossils like this. As you can see, uh, I think you can uh, imagine what it is. This is a, a footprint of a sauropod dinosaur where a small boy can take a uh, bath. And uh, these are, uh, there are many such tracks which have been found in many parts of the world. In India, we have uh, very few, like uh, one in the Cretaceous rocks of uh, Gujarat and one in Jurassic rocks of uh, Kutch, where we found some footprints. And then we have the uh, gastroliths these are the stomach stones which were found which are found mostly in sauropod dinosaurs which consume huge quantities of uh, uh, plant material so for grinding the food material they have this kind of uh, they have swallowed uh, the these stones and as it is done in modern day some of the modern day birds which have the gizzard stones so it's in the same way they used these stones for uh, digesting the food and uh, so these are the, some of the tracks that you can see on the sediments. So these are the uh, three-toed uh, tracks of the uh, therapod dinosaurs or the carnivorous dinosaurs. And these are the burrows made by soft-bodied animals. And what you see here are the tracks of trilobite. So trilobite tracks, uh, the trilobites, as I told you, these are the marine animals which live between 540 and uh, 250 million years, and they have these appendages. These are the arthropods, which have the appendages on the margins, and they walked over the on the soft sediment using these uh, uh, appendages. So those marks are left on the sediment. So these fossils, they actually they come from Kashmir. Uh, there's a place called Hundwara where we find these trilobite fossils, and also in the same sediments we also find these tracks. Then there are coprolites. Coprolites, I think you understand, these are the uh, remains of the uh, fecal matter, the fossil dung. And uh, normally people think, uh, why do we study coprolites? So coprolites, in fact, they provide very important information about the diet of the animal. So if you look at the, uh, this coprolite comes from here in Maharashtra, and this is a dinosaur coprolite. And you can see lots of uh, plant material inside. These uh, dark colored uh, structures, these are actually plant material. And when they were, this uh, coprolite was analyzed, it was macerated, it was dissolved. Uh, lots of fossils, microfossils like these, ostracode, diatoms. And one important thing that was found is the, the silica cells the spindle shape 
silica cells, which are known as phytoliths. And phytoliths are generally found in grasses. And this has shown, because before that, grasses were considered, the fossil grasses uh, are known from Oligocene time, that is around 30 million years or so. But now we have uh, these uh, remains of grasses were found within the coprolite of a dinosaur from 66 million year old rocks. So that means the grasses were already present in the Cretaceous time. So it took the time of origin of the grasses at least by another, uh, by at least 20 to 30 million years. So it's a very important finding that came from the, uh, from India. So, and later even some rice uh, phytoliths were also found in these coprolites. And these are the, some of the Triassic coprolites, coprolites that is uh, 230 million years or so. And in these coprolites, uh, uh, we have found about 50 species of uh, plants, spores and pollens. So without this uh, evidence, the, we had no idea about the vegetation that existed around 230 million years in, in, in the southern part of India. So because the sediments, mostly they are red colored sediments, clays, red clays, and these are oxidized, highly oxidized uh, sediments. So they do not preserve any plant fossils. So this is the only evidence that you can get about the vegetation from of the plants of that time from the copper lights uh, of the Triassic. Uh, so then we have also eggshells. So these are the external. This is the external uh, surface of the eggshells of dinosaurs. Uh, these are from Cowberry Basin, <coughs> and this is a <coughs> egg of a dinosaur, which are generally sauropod dinosaur, which is generally spherical in shape. And you can see here in the cross section the field. <coughs> and these are the eggs of the some of these uh, carnivorous dinosaurs, which are elongated. And uh, in some cases, in rare cases, you can also see uh, some of these eggs containing the embryo, so the skeleton, the hatchling uh, is preserved inside. And this is uh, uh, possible only by uh, looking at these uh, eggs under uh, scanning, CT scanning or X-ray, you can see uh, the presence of these things. And then you have the molecular fossils, uh, which are uh, actually the uh, breakdown products of the various organic compounds like chlorophyll, lignin, and carbohydrates, etc. And they are studied by uh, chromatographic techniques and mass spectrometry. And as I told you earlier, <coughs> the most of these things are preserved as biomarkers. So they provide you uh, uh, indirect evidence of the former existence of certain life forms. So. Uh, particularly, they're useful while studying very old rocks, like uh, rocks uh, older than 540 million years, uh, where we don't find lots of fossils. They're, 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 they're highly useful in finding the uh, those organic compounds. Um, then we have the living fossils. The living fossils are the, those fossils which have remained almost unchanged for uh, millions of years, like, for example, the ginkgo uh, is the modern uh, plant and these are the uh, extinct uh, or the uh, fossil ginkgo, which is known from Jurassic age. Similarly, horseshoe crab is this is the fossil and this is the modern. And coelacanth fishes, they uh, this is the modern and this is the fossil fish. And likewise, marsupials like the diadelphid marsupials, they almost remain unchanged, so they are generally known as living fossils. And then what are the places where you can find <coughs> fossils? So um, the most of the sedimentary rocks which are deposited in uh, places where there was a rapid burial and which were mostly deposited in aquatic environment. So most of these sandy bottoms of shallow, calm seas, river deltas, where a huge amount of sediment <coughs> is deposited <coughs> by the, sorry, by the rivers and lagoons and deserts. Deserts are also important places where once the animal dies, the sand dunes cover them immediately. And so if they are covered by these sand dunes, there also there's a possibility of preservation of the skeletons. Therefore, limestones, 
most of the fine grained sediments like limestones, mudstones, and shales are good uh, candidates for the preservation of the fossils. And the conditions which are necessary for the preservation of the fossils are the they must have some hard parts like the shell, wood, bone, etc. Uh, so the hard parts generally get preserved as uh, as body fossils and as the soft tissues uh, like the skin, muscles. They uh, decompose immediately after death. So they must have some hard parts. Then the environment should be free from oxygen. So if it is an anoxic environment, then there is a greater chance of preservation of uh, animals as fossils. And if the deposition is away from wave action. So that's why if you go to the uh, beach, you'll find lots of shell fragments on the, uh, on, along the beach. So this mainly because of the wave action. So the wave action destroys most of the uh, shells and the even the bones if they are transported by rivers, they also get destroyed in this manner. So then the rapid burial is very important. Immediately after the death, if the animal is covered by sediment, there is a greater chance of its preservation as a fossil. Then swamps, lakes, deltas, and lowland floodplains, these are the places where most of the fossils get preserved. And the field collection is um, most of the time uh, students ask me even in, in our, our classes ask what is this uh, secret behind finding uh, a fossil in the field so there are no such secrets there are no magic formulas because uh, it's only sheer hard work uh, you have to do so spend a lot of time in the field uh, looking for the sediments which are yielding the fossils and you need to have a, a kind of feel for the fossils so that happens only once you spend some time in the field, say 10 days, 15 days, then you will uh, find, once you find the fossils, then you realize the what what they are made up of and what kind of, uh, how they look like. So those things you can guess from the field after field observations. And also there are some, some sometimes there are certain clues which are available when you move along the, uh, like for example, if you're moving along a river channel or along the road cut you will see some fragments of the bone or some fragments of the shell so then you try to see look for where from these shells or the bone fragments are coming so when you look up section if you have a vertical section if you climb up and see where from they're coming then you can locate the place where the fossils are coming from so that is how you can actually locate the uh, fossiliferous horizons from there you can pick up the fossils so generally the rocks that you should look for are the sedimentary as you know these are the only rocks which preserve fossils then rocks are of, they, they should be of right age so if you are looking for dinosaurs you should look uh, in rocks which are 230 million years and 65 million years because that is the time during which dinosaurs lived on the earth then if you're looking for trilobites, it should be between 250 and 540 million years. Those rocks can only yield the uh, 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 trilobites. Similarly, if you're looking for uh, like elephant fossils, so you should look in rocks which are Miocene in age, that is around 20 or even 30 million years to the, uh, the younger rocks. In those rocks only you'll find mammals. So, so that is how you have to decide when you go to the field what what kind of uh, uh, group you're planning to work and rocks are marine or terrestrial so if you're looking for dinosaurs you should look in continental sediments in terrestrial rocks not in marine rocks if you're looking for uh, corals for example you should look in marine rocks then the suitable rocks for the preservation are conglomerates these are the conglomerates are mostly the boulders the pebbles, boulders, and so they are actually, they have been transported for long distances and they have been deposited in one place. So they destroy most of the organic material. So therefore you will not find any fossils. Sandstones are also generally, they're carried by the rivers. So they have been transported for long distances, but still they can contain some fossils, but generally they're relatively less in sandstones as compared to these rocks, the fine grained rocks like limestone, shale, mudstone, they are more abundant. So suitable sites, 
normally it is the railroad cuttings, stream river banks, and badlands. Badlands are the areas where you can find a lot of exposures of rocks. So there you can find those, uh, you may uh, look for, for the fossils. So the field excavation generally uh, it depends on what kind of rocks you are working, what kind of fossils you are working. So if you are working on invertebrate fossils, it's not, it doesn't take much time. But if you are looking on a uh, uh, vertebrate fossil, so here what you are seeing is a humerus of a dinosaur, sauropod dinosaur, uh, in Kaveri Basin. So in from Cretaceous rocks, and initially it looked like this, and then when we exposed it, it is a uh, this much long and then we made a pedestal so we removed the sediment around the uh, bone and then we left the fossil on a pedestal small thin pedestal so we then after that we put the gunny bags uh, we put uh, a, we wrapped the fossil with gunny bags uh, making wet and then putting it on the uh, fossil and wrapping it around and then we put plaster paris and after that once the plaster paris settles we cut the pedestal and turn the bone upside down and again we put the same thing over the plaster paris over the other side and so in this way the bone gets protected from any transportation problems so when transportation takes place it may be sometimes it may get, get broken so to avoid that we make these plaster jackets and then bring them to the lab to remove rest of the uh, uh, rock material from the bone and uh, this is one important finding that we have made in uh, 2017 uh, this is a, a complete near complete so here the head is somewhere here because we have the uh, uh, the anterior part the snout of the animal is uh, uh, is, is buried in the sediment and this part is the tail part and you can see one fin and another fin here so this is a, a marine uh, reptile ichthyosaur and this was not known before from the Indian subcontinent from from the Jurassic and this is nearly complete skeleton about uh, 5.5 uh, 5 meters in length and you can see this is the fin uh, uh, this is the one, uh, and uh, this is a sketch of the skeleton. So uh, we have worked for about ten days to excavate the entire skeleton, and so it, in fact, uh, at least ten students uh, or or MSc students and students from Kutch University, we worked together for about ten days, and uh, we spent about thousand man hours on the on the excavation of this uh, skeleton. So uh, this is a, a major uh, discovery in 2017. And uh, then once you excavate the skeleton, the next step is to mount the specimens. So mounting the specimens, it may take very long time. Sometimes it may take a year or so. So because it has to be uh, protected, uh, it has to be protected by various um, uh, rods and it has to be separate, supported from the ceiling also because they, they are heavy bones. So they had to be uh, made uh, standing by putting many of these supports. So this is a skeleton of the Jurassic uh, dinosaur from India. Uh, this comes from the Pranahita Godavari Valley. And this is located in, now it is uh, uh, on display in Indian Statistical Institute Museum. And this one is the another uh, uh, Jurassic sauropod dinosaur from the same horizon. Uh, from Pranahita Godavari Valley, and it is uh, on display in Birla Science Center in Hyderabad. So the the uh, so we learned about the what are the fossils and how they get preserved, and what are the different kinds of fossils, and how do you uh, search for fossils in the field. Now, uh, uh, what do fossils tell us? What can we learn from the fossils? So many things can be. Uh, uh, obtained from studying the mammals like the you can understand the age of the rocks sedimentary rocks so in in case of sedimentary rocks it is not possible to date them using radiometric met methods it's only the fossils which provide you uh, the age of the uh, rocks 
and if unless they have some uh, igneous rocks occurring in between, like a volcanic flow or volcanic ash occurring in between the sediments, then you can date those uh, rocks. Uh, and they also provide clues to the past environments and ecosystems and how the diversity has changed through time and what how the climatic changes, what are the climatic changes that occurred during the past and how these climatic changes affected the uh, life. Then, of course, the best evidence for evolution of life comes from the fossils. And the past distribution of land and sea, like the continents, how they were arranged in the past, probably you know that in the uh, around 250 million years ago, all the continents were together in a single supercontinent known as Pangaea. So after that, they uh, broke up and, and moved away from each other to reach the present day position. So that you can actually learn from by looking at the fossils. Then, as uh, I have already mentioned about the use of the microfossils in hydrocarbon such. So how do we date rocks? So relative dating is one uh, method which is mostly uh, employed in uh, paleontology, where in stratigraphy, we know that the, there is a law uh, or principle known as principle of superposition, which is pro proposed by Nicholas Steno. So which says that when the uh, sediments get deposited in the aquatic body, they are deposited in a layer, layer by layer. So you can see one layer here and the second layer and third layer, fourth layer and fifth layer. So when they get deposited in this manner, the oldest rock will always be at the bottom and the youngest rock will be at the top. So using this uh, principle, you actually, when you look at the, these uh, sediments, like you have one outcrop or a rock section in one area, say 100 kilometers away from here and another here. So if you see that uh, here, you can see that the uh, we have the beds three and two are present here, whereas here we have only two and one. So three and uh, uh, two and one, uh, two they are present here, but there is no one here. So three is absent here. So you will find that the beds here, the second bed and the second bed here, they contain the same kind of fossils. So using this, you can correlate these beds, these two beds with each other. And since it is occurring above three, we will place this sequence of rocks above, this, above these beds. So in this way, we build a, 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 a stratigraphic or the rock sequence in this manner. So using this um, we analogy, we, we actually we uh, say we can say that these are the older rocks and these are the younger rocks, and the fossils uh, were used in initially most of the periods, geological periods, they were divided. Most of the rock sequences in Europe were divided into Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian, etc. On the basis of this, so because they contain Cambrian contained certain assemblies of fossils. Ordovician contains certain assemblage of fossils. Silurian, similarly, it has similar assemblages. And Carboniferous, for, for example, it has the, these are known as the coal beds because they contain abundant coal. So, and luxuriant vegetation is present Carboniferous. So using these uh, fossils, we have divided the rock sequence across the globe into the periods, geological uh, periods known as Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, like that. So this is how the geological time scale was built. And this is how uh, now we have established a time scale. We know in which period, what kind of fossil assemblages occur. So if you have in a new locality, if you have uh, some fossil assemblages, which are correlatable, say, uh, Cretaceous uh, assemblages, then you, we will date it as Cretaceous in time. Then the so this is how most of the names, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, uh, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, they are all given on this basis. So you have rocks here, like the Cobb limestone, and these are the oldest rocks. These are the Precambrian rocks. 
which in which you will not find any fossils then you have the sedimentary rocks which are deposited in layers and here we have the kyber limestone and here another section where you have the kyber limestone and these are the younger rocks so now you can build a composite section by placing this kyber limestone or this uh, layer the uh, monkopi formation above this you can build a stratigraphic column or the geology uh, this is how geological time scale was built and then you have the carmel formation and you have the uh, carmel formation here so you can place it here in this way a, a complete sequence of rocks representing different time periods has been built and subsequently this was before radioactivity was discovered so once radioactivity was discovered uh, so most of you know about the radio radiocarbon dating and most most people ask me uh, uh, what is the method used for dating uh, rocks or fossils so radiocarbon dating can only be used for dating rocks uh, younger than 50000 years so in some cases like uh, accelerated mass spectrometry you can even date them up to uh, 100000 years but uh, such dates are very rare so uh, this is not generally useful for most of us who work in older rocks like uh, the mesozoic paleozoic or the early cenozoic rocks it is not applicable it's only useful mostly in the rocks like the uh, late pleistocene rocks where you can use this method but for older rocks you have these methods potassium argon method rubidium strontium uranium lead and uranium lead method so where you uh, you can date the uh, very old rocks and mostly the datable material is mostly the igneous rocks like the volcanic rocks which contain the radioactive minerals so using those radioactive minerals you can actually date the rocks so after radioactivity was discovered the geological time scale which was uh, built on the basis of uh, came the fossils so these are the divisions which are made of the rock sequences using the fossils and then after that these dates the numbers numbers and millions of years are added once the some of the uh, datable rock material like the igneous rocks are formed in between this suppose you have a volcanic layer here you can date it and that, that is how many of them have been dated so in this way we have built a geological time scale and you can see how life has evolved from very primitive forms very uh, basic forms to very advanced forms like the first jawed fishes and then the first uh, amphibians and the carboniferous coal swamp deposits and then you have the dinosaurs marine reptiles and the gymnosperms and then you have the angiosperms and then finally the mammals how they had evolved this is how the sequence of evolution has been depicted using the fossils so fossils can also help us in ethological aspects like uh, how the animals behave in lifetime so we have uh, in some places like the egg mountain in uh, in montana where you can find layers of rocks containing uh, hatcheries hatcheries of dinosaur eggs so you have one layer and after that another layer where you have the eggs uh, the nests of the uh, dinosaurs were found so this the means the animals were returning to the same site to uh, lay the eggs over a long period of time so here we find that they in some many of these uh, nests you find that it is a pit in which the eggs were laid and covered with some uh, vegetation and also sediments and uh, it was found that many of the hatchlings which were found around the offsprings the young offspring skeletons which were found in near this uh, these uh, nests they have not developed the bones very well that means they were not able to move out of the uh, nest to get their food so it points to the fact that the these animals like the these uh, hadrosaurid animals they were actually visiting the nest to uh, feed their 
offsprings. So they were taking care of the their offsprings. So this is one uh, thing that you can gain from this kind of uh, study. And here you can see a, a skeleton of a velociraptor, a dinosaur, which you have might have seen in the Jurassic Park. Uh, this skeleton uh, over the nest of the eggs, its eggs. So at one point of time, people believed that Velociraptor is a uh, animal which uh, was stealing the eggs of other animals because in one site, very close to the site of a uh, protoceratops uh, nesting site, a protoceratops, a horned dinosaur was found uh, dead along with the Velociraptor when the, the, the skeletons were interlocked uh, during a fight. So uh, at that time, it was argued that actually this Velociraptor was stealing the eggs of the uh, Protoceratops. But actually, later it was found, a egg was, uh, a nest was found where the Velociraptor actually was actually sitting on the eggs. So it was brooding the eggs. So uh, this is uh, another important uh, finding that was uh, discovered in recent years. And then the uh, fossils can provide you uh, important information about the type of environment in which the uh, sediments were deposited. And so this is very important for a geologist because to understand the, what kind of environment the sediments were deposited. So that helps us to uh, know the in some many cases to find the hydrocarbons and <clears throat> so in that case you can see that many of these brachiopores these are the lamp shells uh, which are invertebrates and they are found today in mostly the marine environments so and they were also found throughout the geological record in marine deposits only along with marine fossils so that means uh, once you find this that means the sediments were deposited in marine environments similarly if you have a crinoid or a sea lily uh, that again marks the uh, presence of a marine condition in the area uh, likewise trilobites also indicate marine conditions but if you have a, a fossil dinosaur or a pine tree that may it is attached so found in uh, uh, in the uh, marine environments because the bones this not the skeletons but only some bones were found so these bones have been transported by river water and deposited in marine environments so uh, fossils play a very important role in understanding the environment of the uh, aquatic body whether it is a marine terrestrial lacustrine or a pond etc and then the paleoecological. So you can actually using the entire fossil assemblage, you can build uh, the ecosystem, reconstruct the ecosystem, how it looked like in the actual conditions. And then this is the ecosystem. If you look at this, this block diagram, this is the ecosystem which was existent at the, uh, before the major mass extinction around 251 million years ago. That is the permian Triassic boundary mass extinction, which killed almost 95% of the species. So after the extinction, in the beginning of the Triassic, you see at the ecosystem, it is depopulated. Uh, there are no organ organisms, hardly any organisms, only opportunistic uh, species, they survived this extinction and those or the only fossils which are found. Similarly, you can using the fossils, you can build or reconstruct the ecosystems in this manner. And you can also see how the ecosystems have changed over time using the fossils. Then, of course, the, the best example for the evolution of life, it comes from the fossils. So if you look at this, this is, this is the uh, uh, evolution, this depicts the evolution of horses. So horse evolution is best documented in North America, where the continuous sequence of uh, uh, different stages uh, through which the horse, horses have passed uh, through, like the evolution of horse from a, a four to five legged animal to three legged animal, and then single toed animal, and finally 
the equus is a single toed animal and how the complexity of the teeth has changed and because the <coughs> initially the horses were living in forest environment and they were feeding on the the foliage the soft foliage of the uh, forest uh, plants but once the forest dwindled when the climate deteriorated though so in the initial stages it was tropical subtropical conditions and you have luxuriant vegetation And for time, we have already seen that they have, we have the uh, silica cells in the grasses. So these silica cells, they grind the teeth very fast. So to overcome this problem, horses have evolved high crown teeth. Teeth have become high crown. Uh, in the early stages, the uh, height of the crown is very small. But as they evolve, they have evolved high crown teeth. And then they have evolved complex anomal structure on the surface of the teeth so this the the surface which occludes with the upper lower and upper teeth they occlude with each other so that surface has very complex anomaly structure so this uh, actually uh, helped the animal to overcome the problem of erosion by uh, the uh, erosion of the teeth by the silica uh, uh, grasses so that is one example, best example for evolution. And another example that I would like to give is of the whales. So these are the, these res, uh, in this map, what you are seeing, the red color is actually the places where we find the uh, rocks of Eocene age, or say 55 million years to 45 million year rocks are found here. And here we find these uh, rocks, um, in these rocks, we find several fossils of the whales. So, fossil whales are found in these uh, rocks. And so, here you can see that the the earliest. Uh, this is actually the uh, the stage which represents the uh, uh, a sister group of the whales. So, the uh, it belongs to. A artiodactyl mammal, as you know, artiodactyls are the eventual ungulates, and they it belongs to the uh, artiodactyl. And artiodactyls, uh, and uh, that includes the hippo, and uh, the this one, which is known as Hindo Hyas, it is known from the uh, place called Kalakot in Jammu and Kashmir. And this animal has partially adopted for aquatic life. So it was living both on land and in water, uh, in search of food, possibly. And uh, then we have the uh, latter stage, which is, uh, this is not a whale stage. Uh, it doesn't represent the stage of whale evolution, but it, it is a sister group of whales. And then we have the Pachycetus, which is a, a whale which has adopted for both living on land as well as on the in the water. Then we have the Ambulocetus, which uh, is a amphibious animal, which have adopted very well, as you can see from the hind legs, which subsequently in subsist subsequent stages, these hind legs are lost. So a number of stages like uh, Indohyas, the sister group of the whales, the earliest whale, Pachycetus, and then the next stage, Ambulocetus, and then the next stage, uh, is the rhodocetus and the cutisetus. These are all the various stages of whale evolution. So initially it's a, a mainly terrestrial, but partially aquatic, but later it became uh, also aquatic. And then this became more aquatic. And then these rhodocetus, they are fully aquatic animals. So this, uh, these fossils were found in the Yosim rocks of India and Pakistan. So the Indian subcontinent uh, is the it was the center of origin for the whales. So the first fifteen that what you are seeing here is the the first fifteen million years of whale evolution. This took place in the Indian subcontinent, and after that they moved out of India along the Tethys, the 
sea that existed between uh, Europe uh, and Africa and India and Asia, along this path is they moved towards the west into uh, near to Africa and then to the south of North America and also to South, south America. So the first uh, 15 million years of whale evolution uh, took place in Indian subcontinent. We should be very proud of that. We have a, 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 an excellent fossil record of this from India. And then, of course, uh, the uh, biodiversity changes, how the life has changed over time. So, or, uh, so if you look at this, uh, uh, these curves uh, here, you'll see that the, since uh, the Cambrian time, uh, from 540 million years, we have a sharp rise in the diversity of the animals, and there is a sharp uh, decline here. So this is the uh, time when there was an extension, major extension at between Ordovician and Silurian period, and there is another major extension here uh, at the end of the Devonian, and then we have the the most devastating. Uh, extension, mass extension, that is at the end of the Permian, around 250 million years. So this has removed 95% of the species from the Earth's surface. And the fourth one is between the Triassic and Jurassic boundary. And fifth one is around 65 million years between Cretaceous and uh, Paleoge Paleogene. And this uh, extension uh, killed the dinosaurs. So these are the five major mass extinctions that have been recorded uh, through the last 540 million years. So this is possible only through the study of the fossils. So this came mostly the this data came from the marine fossil record, which is best preserved fossil record. So based on that, we have been able to show that there were major mass extinctions at these periods and, and also people are now working on the causes for these mass extinctions. And then, of course, the uh, uh, the another application that fossils have is the paleobiogeography. Paleobiogeography is the <clears throat> subject which deals with the past distribution of land and sea and how animals are distributed on these land masses. So this was originally proposed by Alfred Wegener, a uh, meteorologist from Germany. And uh, at the time, he has looked at several factors like the close similarity of the coastlines between South America and Africa, and also the distribution of the glacial deposits in the southern continents. So he has, uh, there are many glacial deposits which occur in all the southern continents like the India, Africa, South America, Australia, and Antarctica. So all the direction of the flow of the glaciers, it indicates that it has, the glaciers have moved from the South Pole towards these regions. <clears throat> so based on this, he argued that all these continents were together, they formed a single continent, Pangaea, at one point of time, around 250 million years ago. The main evidence for the togetherness of the Gondwana land continents comes from these plants, the glossopters that you have seen earlier. And then there are other reptiles like the <coughs> Listosaurus is a mammal-like reptile. And then you have the Cynognathus is another reptile, mammal-like reptile. And uh, so these are the, some of the examples which uh, indicate that these continents were together at one point of time. Um, uh, Madam, uh, do you think I have exceeded the time? No, it's fine. It's OK, sir. Actually, you are enlightening the students. Uh, if you have no problem, then I'll continue. No, you can always continue, sir. You're welcome. OK. okay. So if you look at the uh, development of paleontology, um, in fact, the fossils uh, the, were identified as early as in 15th and 17th century by uh, Nicholas Steno and um, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, but uh, even before, before that, Conrad Gessner, uh, he has actually illustrated many of these fossils in an encyclopedia of uh, animals. And he compared them with modern uh, animals, like the fossil crab with a modern crab, and the tongue stones of sharks with a 
the sharks. So because at that time, shark teeth were considered as tongue stones and they were com compared with the uh, modern sharks. So although he had no idea about the evolution, but he could, he could uh, uh, understand that the, these are the remains of the organisms. So uh, for most of the 19th century and 20th century, paleontology has remained mostly as an observational science. Uh, the focus was mainly on finding fossils and naming them and describing them. And many of the important discoveries like the dinosaurs and uh, large extinct animals, they uh, attracted the attention of the public because they, they are huge in nature. So many of the dinosaurs are huge animals. And uh, the uh, another line of uh, uh, investigation was uh, started by William Smith. Uh, a, a William Smith was a, a surveyor, a British surveyor, surveyor who was actually uh, surveying the canals of the uh, England, and also he was also looking at the he's mapping the uh, coal fields of England, and then he found uh, that. In, as we have seen earlier, while dating rocks, we have seen that the sediments are deposited in layers, and each layer contains certain assemblage of fossils. So that <clears throat> he has found here in the uh, British uh, exposures, and he found that uh, certain levels contain certain fossils, and the upper and lower levels, they do not have those fossils. And But at that time, evolution was not known. So. Uh, the theory of evolution was not uh, known. So he used those uh, fossils for correlating rocks. Suppose you have a, a rock sequence here in Delhi and you have another rock sequence in somewhere in the in Dehradun, for example. So if you have the same kind of uh, rocks, uh, same kind of fossils occurring at different levels within the rocks, then you can correlate those levels which have the similar fossils. So in this manner, he could actually, by looking at the, the fossils, he could identify what are the rock types and what kind of rock types are these and how they are related to the other sections in other parts of the uh, parts of England. And he's the one who pro provided the first geological map. So he made the first geological map. And then, of course, the George Cuvier, a French uh, paleontologist, he's actually named as the, he's considered as the first paleontologist uh, <clears throat> so he understood that the remains that you see in rocks are actually the traces of past organisms which have became extinct and uh, the and he has a extraordinary ability using the bone surfaces. Suppose you have a, a bone. On the surface of the bone, you have certain facets on which the muscles are attached. So by looking at the muscle scars on the bones, you could actually uh, understand what was the function of these uh, uh, bones. And also, you could identify them as genus and species even based on a single bone. So that was, uh, in fact, uh, legendary. Uh, in a sense, and he is considered as the uh, the first paleontologist, and or in fact even the first vertebrate paleontologist. Then, following Cuvier, we had several people in England. For example, Richard Owen, who is uh, credited with naming the the name dinosaur, uh, and in 1842, and Thomas Axling, William Buckland. Uh, these are the people, who, Edward Forbes, these are the people who actu uh, actually uh, describe many of the fossils, like the reptilian fossils, like the dinosaurs, and also Archaeopteryx. Uh, uh, they actually, they were teaching, also teaching anatomy in many of the medical schools, and they uh, used the, uh, the, the knowledge of anatomy to uh, describe most of these fossils and uh, they uh, gave a, a very detailed, very comprehensive description of the anatomy of the fossils. And th then after that, we have uh, the amateur paleontologist, 
Mary Anning, uh, who comes from Lyme Regis. This is the uh, British coast, uh, which is also known as the Jurassic Coast, and which is a world her heritage site. And um, she was credited with the discovery of the first British ichthyosaur in 1812. That was at the age of 12. So her father was actually collecting fossils, and she used to help. She used to help him, and at that age, she found the ichthyosaur, and then first plesiosaur in 20, 1824, first pterosaur, the flying reptile in 1828. So these are the some of the huge skeletons that were found, and this led, uh, this fascinated many British uh, public uh, for fossils, and. Uh, so she, she was responsible, although she was not a scientist, she discovered many of these fossils and then many of them she, she sold to uh, people like, for example, William Buckland. He used to buy most of these fossils from her. And that is how many of the scientific discoveries came to light. And uh, <coughs> so subsequently, the significance of fossils uh, in dating rocks was uh, is well appreciated only after the acceptance of theory of evolution. So this uh, came in 1859 when Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace they proposed the uh, theory of organic evolution, and uh, the they this theory uh, underlined the fact that fossils provide direct evidence that organisms changed throughout the past, throughout the geological past. And some became extinct and some survived. And it is the organic evolution that is inherent in the succession of fossils. So what, whatever successions that William Strata Smith, William Smith found in the uh, British uh, islands, this, the faunal successions are actually, are the fossil successions they are actually uh, because the successions you could see because of the change in life, the evolution of life. And then after that, you have the discoveries of radioactivity, DNA, and plate tectonics uh, in the latter part of 20th century. Um, so we were able to, using these techniques, we can we were able to uh, date the rocks precisely and also put the uh, various uh, uh, evolutionary concepts in a uh, clear perspective. And now it is, uh, uh, we take it granted for that paleontology as an evolutionary uh, science. Uh, and most of the changes that you see through geological time are, they actually reflect the evolutionary changes in past organisms and the environments which was not the case in uh, 19th century. The current focus in paleontology is basically on, this is since 1980, uh, there has been a shift in paleontological research. The main focus is towards the understanding the dynamics of extension and di diversity, biodiversity. So basically we are looking at the five major mass extension boundaries, how the these mass extension boundaries uh, at these boundaries, how the faunal changes or faunal or floral changes have taken place, and what are the causes for these changes, and how the biodiversity has changed across these boundaries and in between the boundaries, and what are the uh, climatic and environmental conditions responsible for these changes. Then, and the mechanism of development and preservation, how the animals, once they die, they get buried, they they may be sometimes they may be exposed to the surface uh, conditions and they may be exposed to predators or the scavengers and then after that they get buried under the sediments and then finally they are uh, they become fossils and and then a paleontologist discovers them and recovers them so until then between these things that is the death between death and final recovery there are many changes that the fossils undergo. So what are these changes that happen over the time? So these, these things are being studied extensively nowadays. Then three-dimensional morphology. I will show you some of the slides where you can see that how CD, uh, 3D scanning or the CT scanning is being used 
uh, nowadays to reconstruct the anatomy of the bones as well as the muscle reconstruction on the bones and uh, how the animals have uh, used these structures for certain functions in life and also histology the study of biological tissues so uh, we, this helps us in understanding the growth physiology disease and uh, soft tissue anatomy uh, like for example how the trunk and horns are attached to the body so this those things can be understood by studying the histology and evo devo uh, evolution of development is uh, is a important thing which is related essentially related to biology where we are looking at the developmental stages within the animal so the growth stages within the animal so starting from the embryonic stage to the adult stage what are the important changes so what can you get obtain important information about the ancestral condition of the animals uh, the living animals that uh, is is an important aspect that we are actually nowadays we are trying to combine paleontology uh, study the fossils uh, with along with the uh, evo devo which is helping us to understand how the certain uh, anatomical features had evolved in, in the lifetime of the animal so then we have the biomolecular paleontology where we use uh, different uh, sophisticated instrumentation to know the uh, biomarkers uh, the fossil organic compounds which are preserved <coughs> in the rocks to extract them and to see how the these organic compounds can be related to the uh, modern organisms <laughs> and then biogeography that you have learned and ecology is the uh, the footprints the tracks that you see like for example in case of dinosaurs the footprints or the tracks have been used to understand the uh, the locomotion within these animals. So these are the some of the issues which are the current focus. And I think this will remain a focus for at least another two, uh, one or two decades, uh, because the, these are the major uh, issues that we need to address at the moment. So <clears throat> uh, the now the uh, there is a Huttonian principle, James Hutton's principle, that uh, present, presented the key, key to the past. So at that time, he suggested that all the geological processes that are happening on the Earth's surface, they happened in the past also. So the same thing that is happening, that happened in the past also. But what we can say in this case is that the past is the key to future, because many of the things that are happening are going to happen in future they have already happened in the past so like many of the extensions so now we are actually talking about this sixth mass extension so we had seen several mass extension in the past already we had five major mass extensions so the uh, these to, by understanding the causes for these mass extensions what are the environmental changes that uh, led to these extinctions, we can actually anticipate some of these uh, possible extinctions in the future. So the, <clears throat> and also uh, in fossil record, we'll find lots of uh, novel body plants, which uh, are not known. And uh, we try want to understand how these uh, body plants had evolved and how they are related to the modern uh, forms. And so, uh, paleontologists and geologists have a great role to play in predicting future scenarios uh, through the study of the past events, like the most of these extinction events, and then after the extinction, how the animals recover. So that is also important. So how these how the environmental changes have taken place in the past, uh, those are the things which are uh, important. Uh, in future then systematic paleontology uh, this is the uh, subject where it is basically to study the fossil once you collect the fossil and then you try to understand the morphology and then describe the morphology and then publish it if it is a new species you publish it so this should continue because this is the basis on which you can actually build other 
subjects, other branches. So once you know the uh, fossil, what is the what kind of fossil it is, what kind of group it belongs, then you can actually understand what is the environment, what is the climate, climatic conditions in which it lived, and what are the uh, evolutionary changes that have taken place. Those things you can only learn only after systematic study of the animals. And then paleobiodiversity. So when you look at the, the, the this uh, figure that you have seen at this point, almost 95% of species became extinct. And moreover, 99% of the species that ever lived on the Earth's surface are already extinct. So that means a vast number of fossils still remain in the rocks that are, are yet to be recovered. Uh, the, the fossil record is almost is, is mostly incomplete, but of course in recent years with new techniques and new uh, improvements in recovery techniques, the many new fossils have been discovered, but still a lot of uh, fossils remain to be recovered. And there are many unanswered questions. Uh, uh, and in fact, many times when you discover new fossils, they also raise some new questions. And uh, <clears throat> so we need to integrate all these discoveries into an evolutionary scheme of things. Uh, so they actually help us in improving our understanding about the evolutionary processes uh, that uh, led to extinction of life forms and also the ecosystem, the change of ecosystems. So many events like the major uh, events in the history of life, for example, origin, radiation, and extinction, uh, these are the long-term terms, which we can see only through the study of the fossils. So uh, as you can see here, the this is the Mesozoic era, end of the Mesozoic era, and this is the Cenozoic. And before that, the mammals were very few. The very few branches of mammals were there. Then at the beginning of the Cenozoic, we could see this much diversification. So there is an adoptive diversification of the mammals in this uh, during this uh, time in the Cenozoic. So this, uh, what are the uh, uh, causes for these adaptive radiations within different groups of mammals that is also subject of uh, uh, study by many groups of paleontologists. And as I mentioned, mass extinction is, a, a, is the event uh, which kills many of the, about 70% of the species become extinct. And the, then only a few of them survive and then the diversification takes place. So most of these diversifications, the whatever animals which are left after the extinction, they are not suited to the new environment. So they have to adopt to the new environments and then to uh, uh, adopt to the new ecologies. So therefore, this is uh, important to understand how these animals have responded to these extinction events and then they have adopted to the new and momental conditions. So, uh, for example, this Permian Triassic extinction it was a total uh, devastation, complete killing of the most of the animals. Uh, the new forms which appear after the extinction in the beginning of the Triassic, uh, they are not related to the previous organisms, and no new phyla appear. Uh, so, the the question that we need to address is when and where for the ancestors of the newly radiating forms. So how, from what group of organisms these new forms had evolved. And then molecular paleobiology. Uh, so today, uh, many of the, if you see most of the publications in biology, you can see that most of them are on, based on molecular sequencing. So the phylogenetic reconstructions are essentially based on phylogenetic sequencing, because you can do with, with the modern uh, organisms. But uh, when you look at the diversity of life on the earth, the extinct organisms only a small fraction of all those uh, forms that existed on the earth before. And on the other hand, fossils do not contain any biomolecules, unless you have very 
recent fossils, sub recent, or even neogen uh, uh, sediment uh, uh, fossils, which contain which may contain some uh, biomolecules, but most of them do not contain any biomolecules. Only those are only degraded um, biomarkers. So, but fossils are necessary to calibrate the phylogenetic trees. So most of the molecular divergence time estimates are based on the time of divergence between two branches of a, a, a two lineages or the two clades which have diverged from a common ancestor. But when they diverge from a common ancestor, the morphological differences between the two clades do not appear immediately. They appear after some time. So these differences you can see in the fossils because they appear after some time. Only when you see the morphological difference that you can see that there is a difference between the clades. So using that time as a divergence time, though many of the molecular divergence time estimates have been made. And of course, many times molecular time uh, divergence time estimates are not close to what the paleontologist uh, uh, suggest uh, on the age of the or the origin of the uh, fossils but generally uh, but uh, using by an integrated study of the molecules and fossils uh, we have been able to narrow down on these differences in recent years and uh, uh, so we have also now we are also working on the biomarkers many of the biomarkers which you can extract from the uh, sediments or the from the fossils for example here you can this is a, a pyrolysis uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry uh, instrument this is from bombay iit uh, where my student has worked on dinosaur eggshells and these are the eggshells the, these are the best preserved eggshells and you here you can find some protein biomarkers so this is known as dicato pyrone so this is a protein biomarker and normally they are not preserved but here in this uh, well preserved eggshells we found this so so there is a, a chance of preservation of organic material in many of these uh, uh, bones and uh, organic materials like the eggshells for example so we actually interpreted this because the environment in which the eggshells were preserved, the eggs were preserved, the, the environment was so uh, congenial because the microbes which actually uh, destroy the organic compounds, they are uh, affected by the uh, desiccating conditions existed at that time. And also we believe that the eggshell which uh, forms the which is a biomineral which has actually protected the organic material from the uh, decomposition so this is uh, uh, one new line of uh, research that is taking place and we found for the first time uh, this uh, protein biomarker from the eggshells of dinosaurs and then uh, we are also using stable isotope for geochemistry where we look at the different stable isotopes like the carbon oxygen and to study the, uh, to understand the, uh, the uh, temperature at that time, whether it was very hot or cold, and then to see whether the diet of the animals is, uh, uh, what kind of vegetation they were feeding on. So in this case, we have done for the dinosaur nesting sites or the eggs, we found that the, uh, they were mostly feeding on C3 vegetation, C3 pathway of photosynthesis where C3 uh, plants are those which are mostly uh, <clears throat> forest uh, trees and herbaceous plants and some grasses but C4 is essentially a grassland grassland vegetation so what we found is it's a C3 vegetation so this is uh, another way of uh, finding the the diet of the animals using stabilized mm -hmm. geochemistry and you can also do that uh, by studying the uh, coprolites, for example, you can find the, if you find some uh, uh, palynofossils, you can actually determine uh, what kind of vegetation was there. Then Evo Devo is another area, which is the most uh, <clears throat> uh, potential area for the uh, interaction or integration of data from fossils and biology. 
uh, and uh, so here we are actually using the uh, the genetic sequences of the developmental genes and trying to understand how the a certain feature has evolved through time uh, and what are the genes responsible for these uh, uh, evolutionary changes and in fact we can see that this has been observed in some of in the uh, in the in the transformation of the reptilian bones into ear articles of the mammals so these are the two bones in uh, <coughs> this one uh, the articular the yellow one here and the green one the quadrate these are the two bones which are present in the jaw joint of the uh, a reptile so you can see a number of bones in, jaw, in the jaw of a, a reptile but when you look at the mammalian jaw there are hardly any uh, it's a single mandibular bone and the some of these bones the articular and quadrate they have been shifted to the inner ear so where they form the incus and malleus so this has been uh, found in some of the mammal like reptiles the mammal like reptiles uh, which gave rise to the mammals so those studies have been compared with the uh, some of the modern the growth stages of the modern mammals uh, the developmental stages of the modern mammals like the placental mammals and marsupial mammals and using that we could actually interpret how this transformation has taken place then uh, uh, some of the mammals for example they have uh, it has been recently in uh, some excellently preserved mammals skeletons have been found in china and using those skeletons we would we have been able to see how the the changes the ear articles uh, are correlated with the brain cap, uh, capacity the endocranial cavity the size of the endocranial cavity so when this was this is the fossil and this was compared with all the uh, early mammals and many of the uh, modern mammals uh, it was found that the it is it has the already it is all it's very primitive jurassic mammal but still it doesn't have any of these features which indicate that there were ear articles which were lying here those ear articles have already been shifted to the middle ear so these are the some of the things that you can actually uh, make out uh, or uh, understand by integrating both biology and uh, paleontology so in the past we were using uh, tools like this uh, for excavation of the fossils, chisels, hammers, and uh, these things. And at the most, we were using this microscope, st simple stereoscopic microscope. Uh, later, of course, we have graduated to uh, using zoom microscopes with uh, attached digital camera. And then, of course, we use these image analyzers and also some tabletop scanning electron microscope or La, the normal scanning electron microscope at the most we are using that but now uh, and also these are the some of the tools that have been used uh, for uh, uh, cleaning fossils and this is a, a pneumatic tool or a sand, sand, sand blaster uh, which is used for removing the uh, rock matrix from the surface and these are the some of the equipments that are being used for preparation of fossils. But now we have, uh, uh, we are now employing new techniques, like for example, cathode luminescence, uh, which actually, uh, uh, <clears throat> this is a SEM picture. And uh, this is an SEM uh, uh, picture. Uh, this is a, a cathode luminescence picture where you can see that wherever you have uh, some uh, pure material is there that is uh, there is no uh, luminescence but where you have uh, something like a manganese iron substitution then you can see a lot of luminescence so this helps us in 
many of the pathological conditions, for example, in extrals, we can see sometimes because of pathology, uh, they form one layer of eggshell over the other layer. So this can be understood through the study of, this can be easily understood by looking at uh, these eggshells, the thin sections of the eggshells under the cathode luminescence microscope. So which is generally attached to a microscope or maybe to a SEM, scanning electron microscope. And then we can also use uh, this uh, neutron tomography. Um, this is a, a egg of a dinosaur, which uh, normally if you uh, want to see the, the inner contents of the egg, uh, you may have to break it. But if you don't want to break it, then the best way is to, to send it through a uh, uh, neutron tomography where uh, the, the resolution is very high. And so in many of the X-ray uh, tomography uh, or the CT tomography, C uh, CT scans that you get in the medical hospitals, they are low resolution scans so that they, they will not provide and so moreover they cannot distinguish between the composition of the eggshell and that of the sediment so if they have the same composition like limestone and eggshell is also calcium carbonate so it's difficult to uh, differentiate the two so but if you have a, a neutron tomography then you can actually see the many of these bones so uh, in three dimensions, they can be seen. And this is another technique that is being used. And electron backscatter diffraction is another method in which you can <clears throat> use the SEM uh, using the backscatter diffraction. Uh, the, you can see the crystallites or the, the mineral, not the crystal, structure within the minerals and uh, within the eggshell so how the crystals are organized so <clears throat> uh, the angle if they are parallel to the the vertical line they will give blue color if they are slightly at an angle they will give different colors so this is another method which is being used to see how the uh, shells are organized that the minerals are organized within the shells and then ct scanning so uh, this is a most important thing that has come now and it's being extensively used to know the, to understand the skeletal anatomy and also soft tissue anatomy. So this uh, can be used to, if you have one part of the skull is available, so you can, you can reconstruct the other part of the skull using the CT scanning. And this uh, takes many 2D pictures and these 2D pictures are, uh, uh, reconstructed into a 3D structure. So in many of the cases, like for example, we have seen in the earlier case, the egg, egg and similarly many uh, fossils are very delicate and they are embedded within the rock. So it's difficult to prepare them. If you prepare them, maybe they will get uh, destroyed. So to avoid that, the many of the and many museum specimens, they cannot be moved from one place to another. So in such cases, they are, uh, scanned under a computer tomography and they give you 3D pictures. So there is a software which can actually make 3D, uh, 2D structures into 3D structures. And using that, you can actually uh, 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 develop the complete anatomy of the animal, the skull, or the skeleton. And then you can, even in many cases, you can rotate the specimen. So this is useful because if you, if today, if I want to study a fossil from India and compare it with something abroad uh, in USA or Europe, I have to go there and look at this fossil in their museums. But if you have a 3D scan, then you can uh, CT scan. The, if it is put on the website, it's made available on the website of the museum. So you can actually look at the specimen just going through the website. So that is that makes the life easy, uh, study easy. So another thing that we are using now nowadays is biomechanics. So finite element analysis uh, is another uh, engineering principle where they use to test the strength of the buildings. So uh, uh, it has been applied to 
some of the dinosaur skulls, for example, here, and uh, a, a, by bite forces, assuming that the dinosaurs have a biting force of uh, uh, 1300 uh, uh, newtons, 13,000 newtons. So if you apply in a computer modeling, uh, this is done through computer modeling. So you divide the skull into a number of triangular structures and in the computer software, and then you apply the bite force and you try to see how this is affecting the skull bones because there are many uh, gaps within the skull. So these are uh, many gaps are present. And so uh, <clears throat> the, the gaps between the skulls, most of the, uh, the bite force, force is applied along these vertical structures and the, these vertical structures on here. And these uh, gaps between the bones is basically, uh, it serves as a shock absorber. So that is why they have these uh, gaps in the skull. So this is how it is interpreted, how the uh, uh, therapod dinosaurs, like Tyrannosaurus rex, how they use their uh, skulls or the jaws for biting other animals. And then X-ray microscopy, this is another method which you can use uh, uh, without destroying the fold. For example, if we want to study the eggshell, we have to make uh, a thin section of the eggshell. So for that, we have to destroy the eggshell. But if you don't want to destroy the eggshell, then this is the best way where you can actually, without destroying, you can get slices of the uh, radial section of the eggshell in this manner. So these are the uh, various methods and you can in fact see some of the uh, resorption craters here on the surface, resorption craters of the, uh, when the embryo takes the calcium from the shell, uh, they form uh, craters on the inner surface of the shell. So those structures can be easily seen under the X-ray microscopy without destroying the shell. So, so these are the, some of the uh, uh, modern uh, advancements within the uh, field of paleontology and paleontology uh, is uh, has a had a glorious uh, past, and I think it it is uh, it has uh, it will have a glorious future as well because with the new advancements in the technology and new uh, techniques that are used in the field as well as in the lab, we can actually uh, we'll be able to understand many more things and we'll be able to uh, reveal more and more new fossils and uh, new life forms that existed in the past and but today they're not present so thank you very much for your patience uh, i'm sorry i have taken a lot of time uh, almost two hours it's so if you have any questions you can, uh, i'm here to answer thank you so much sir it was indeed a pleasure to hear from you now I would like to invite Shreya Pujari, the co-host for the event, to carry on with the further proceedings. Shreya, over to you. Thank you, Professor Prasad, sir, for taking the time to speak to us about the extensive field of paleontology. We really appreciate having this mysterious area clarified. Your years of research, your profound understanding of the subject, and your prowess to present it in such a lucid manner had quite an impact on our audience. Sir, we have a few questions for you. We would like to start with the faculty members itself. So I would request our esteemed professors, if they have any queries or questions related to your talk, to please put them forward. Uh, sir, I have a question. Yep. Uh, sir, in the absence of any fossil sample, can mm -hmm. uh, phylogenetic analysis help us in identifying the lineage? I mean, uh, if any statistical analysis is really helpful in finding the lineage if some fossil samples are missing. Uh, so that's my simple question, is sir. Yeah, I think for, uh, uh, if you're looking at the modern uh, uh, XR, Maybe you can use the phylogenetic uh, uh, trees, uh, you can make the phylogenetic trees based on molecular, uh, 
molecular phylogenies, so a molecular sequencing. Uh, but uh, if you are trying to relate with the fossil uh, taxa, then of course you need to have the fossils. Otherwise, uh, it's not possible. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So we have a few students with us who wish to put their questions directly to you. If okay. you may allow, may I call them? Uh, please, please. Thank you, sir. Aditi, please come on screen and put your question forward. Thank you, Shreya. And thank you, sir, for such an enlightening session. So I just wanted to ask, what were the challenges that you encountered as a paleontologist and is there any suggestion that you would like to give to the students who wants to pursue the subject? Yeah, I think uh, if if you are you have a passion for the uh, you can spend time in the field and you have the uh, interest in the subject, then this is the field. Uh, but of course, we have a lot of in initially, when I started uh, doing uh, research, when I, when I started uh, doing research for my PhD, uh, we don't we did not have so many facilities that exist today. So the even the even when we went to the field work, it is only by uh, seeking uh, help from the trucks and also sometimes uh, which I think was trucks and sometimes some local transport. That is how we used to move around but today uh, people can actually hire vehicles to do field work in the uh, in remote areas and also many places uh, particularly uh, there are places like tribal areas we face a lot of hostility from local uh, population because uh, there are cases where the uh, in those areas many because of the presence of limestone many new uh, lime cement companies have come up and they have actually acquired most of the land around the those comp cement companies. So people were afraid that we are going there to uh, snatch their lands. So sometimes they become very hostile and sometimes they may, may kill you also. So this we have faced in Madhya Pradesh where we went to in search of dinosaur nesting sites. So sometimes you have to face uh, things like um, some some areas are the area, for example, Pranita Godavari Valley, where many of the dinosaur skeletons or the vertebrate skeletons were found. These are the areas which are uh, having Naxalites. So Naxalites uh, sometimes they uh, uh, actually misunderstand and believe that we are actually informer of the police, and the police thinks that we are the informers of the Naxalites. So that is one danger that one faces when visiting places like those uh, and um, of course uh, field work is not a easy task uh, you have to spend lots of time in the in the outside and as you have seen the excavation site of the, uh, the so this was very hot around it was around uh, 35 between 35 and 40 degrees temperature so we had to spend since morning eight o'clock the evening uh, seven o'clock used to spend there and it was so scorching heat so it's very difficult to sustain in such uh, conditions so of course it's a tough job and it's, uh, uh, also it demands a lot of time and if you have have the uh, passion so this is for you Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I would like to call Professor Om Prakash, sir, to present his question. Yeah, please. I'm not, I'm not able to hear. Yeah. Uh, OP, sir, unmute yourself. Uh, I'm audible to. So thank you so much yes, for yes. your enlightening lecture. Sir, I want to just ask uh, one question that if we uh, study that Cretaceous paleogenic extinction that takes place uh, 66 million year ago mm -hmm. and uh, right now the scientists uh, talk about six mass extinction 
so sir the factors that responsible for fifth mass extinction and the factor that is going to responsible for sixth mass extinction i i mean what are the i mean sir correlation i mean similarity and differences regarding outcomes that takes place fifth at sixth uh, fifth mass extinction and uh, is that going to be on sixth mass extinction uh, if you if you look at the uh, causes uh, for the uh, cretaceous paleogene mass extinction which killed the dinosaurs okay sir okay so, sir uh, this extinction uh, was there are two uh, hypotheses one okay it was the volcanic hypothesis and the other one it was the uh, uh asteroid impact hypothesis so the asteroid impact hypothesis says that there was a 10 the kilometer diameter uh, asteroid hitting the earth surface at, at that time and which actually created a lot of dust in the atmosphere and okay so, so this dust in the aerosols in the atmosphere they block the sunlight and then they after so you have a initially there was a cooling and then later as the uh, dust settles in the uh, greenhouse condition and this uh, also acid rain actually kill most of the organisms in the ocean as well as on the land this is one hypothesis another one is says that the it is not the actual impact it is actually the volcanic eruption volcanic eruption because at that time you have the if you know the deccan plateau is actually volcanic uh, province so we have a, we have a 3 right. km thick volcanic sequence here so this uh, happened at about the same time so it started erupting around 67 million years ago and continued up to 62 million years ago but there was a major phase that is 80% of the volume of the eruption took place very close to the boundary that is the cretaceous paleogene boundary so the supporters of the volcanic hypothesis suggest that the same kind of amount yes was generated at the time of the volcanic eruption as that of the asteroid impact so there are two competing hypotheses at the moment to suggest that the uh, these two causes were responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs and other organisms from the oceans so this is for the uh, cretaceous paleogene mass extinction but today what we are talking about is the we are talking about some of the many of the species that are uh, disappearing at a very fast rate but uh, uh, the main cause that is for this is the climatic change so the change in the temperature so if you look at uh, in the geological past we have several such climatic changes so such several such greenhouse conditions several such ice cores conditions so even in the cretaceous middle part of the cretaceous we had a major uh, greenhouse condition and then we have the around 55 million years ago we have another uh, greenhouse condition so and again the mammals uh, and various kinds of animals they have uh, uh, been affected and then they have returned back uh, and they tried after the extinct so the uh, conditions that uh, we have for the uh, proposed the so called sixth extinction are not very clear at the moment it's only the climatic change we are proposing so but the climatic change as i mentioned it has happened several times in this uh, geological past and the life has responded uh, to these changes and have returned back uh, to try again so we cannot compare both the uh, cretaceous paleogene and the, the proposed uh, mass uh, mass extinction uh, the sixth mass extinction which is not at the same scale as we have seen at the cretaceous paleogene or any other mass extinction boundaries okay sir thank you sir thank you very much sir Uh, it is quite enlightening to see even our professors being so curious about your presentation. Uh, sir, next, I would like to invite Ashwini to present his query. Thank you, Priya, and thank you, sir, for such an informative talk on paleontology. So, my question is to you, sir: What are the different courses that you need to pursue for future studies in paleontology? Yeah. And sir, are there any scholarships and Uh, internship for running specifically for this branch. Uh, for paleontology, 
uh, in uh, Western countries, uh, because it is the, at the interface of biology and geology. In Western countries, paleontology is also taught in biology departments and uh, geology departments, uh, predominantly in geology departments, but they are also taught in several biology departments. In India, if you want to pursue uh, paleontology at masters, then the only thing is that you should uh, uh, get a master's degree in geology. So because it is not taught in any biology departments here. Maybe they, they, they're teaching one uh, paper or one uh, section on paleontology, but not a, a full course on this. So here uh, in India, you can only uh, get into paleontology through the study of geology. So geology is the only way. Or if you want to do, do the masters abroad, there are many uh, universities which offer masters in paleontology. So directly masters in paleontology, like for example, Bristol University has it, then Manchester University has it. Then we have the University of Autonomous University of Madrid has it. And so there are many such universities in Europe. There is a list of at least 10 to 15 uh, universities where you can study uh, paleontology um, uh, at master's level without studying the geology. But in fact, it is useful if you have a, a geology course at BSc level and uh, also a biology course. And nowadays, a lot of statistics is being used in uh, paleontology. So the data is being more quantified. So for that, you need to have some knowledge of the statistics. So there are, uh, as such, uh, I think you can find uh, several scholarships for, the, uh, for studying abroad and uh, you, you have this uh, uh, Erasmus Mundus, and then you have the Pangea, whatever it is. So there are many such um, uh, scholarships for master's courses, so that you can uh, Google and find out. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ashwini. I believe many participants must have been curious about the same. Now, I would like to call Divya for her question. Good afternoon, sir. So mm -hmm. it's a great, great pleasure speaking to you, sir. So, so my question to you is: In your wonderful journey of paleontology, what was your most exciting findings? Uh, so, as uh, 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 Dr. Kamaljit uh, has already mentioned about it, it's about the sixty-six million year world fossil mammal that we found in the Deccan volcanic province. In the Deccan volcanic province, we have the volcanic flows and in between we have the sedimentary rocks. So these are the times during which there was no volcanic activity and the low lying areas on the, uh, uh, the topography, they got filled with lakes and these lakes were an important places where the life thrived. And here we find a lot of fossils within the uh, sediments which are deposited in the lakes and then are subsequently they're covered by uh, another volcanic flow. So in these volcanic uh, sedimentary rocks we find a lot of fossils. So I found the first uh, Cretaceous mammal from India and because at the time uh, people believed that mammals were uh, actually they originated in North America and from there they dispersed into India when India collided with Asia around 55 million years ago. So there were no mammals on the Indian sub subcontinent as it was drifting as an island uh, landmass towards the north. So it was part of the Pangaea, the supercontinent, and then it broke apart from the Pangaea and then drifted towards the north uh, over a period of uh, 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 almost 50 million years. So this drifting resulted in isolation of the Indian subcontinent. So India should not have developed any mammalian fauna. So that is what people argued. And uh, uh, it is said that most of the mammals today we have on the Indian subcontinent, they were derived from the northern land masses, that is Europe and Asia. But uh, in 1988, I found this mammal from a place uh, about 70 kilometers west of Hyderabad. And this is the a 
a, a tribospinic eutherian mammal. Eutherian mammals are the mammals from which the placentals had evolved. And so this mammal, uh, uh, earlier most of the people, uh, most of the Western paleontologists argued that since the most the, the oldest occurrences of these eutherian mammals are from uh, North America, they originated there and then dispersed to southern continents. And there are, at present, even today, there are no eutherian mammals on the southern continents, all the southern continents, except India. So in that respect, it is a very important finding. And now we realize that this is this mammal has, uh, we did uh, phylogenetic analysis of the characters, morphological characters, and we found that this mammal is has originated in India and subsequently dispersed into Europe and Africa uh, around the uh, 65 million years or so. Thank you, Divya. Sanjana, please present your question next. <coughs> Thank you, Shreya. Thank you, sir, for this informative lecture. So, sir, is there a massive drop in quality of Cretaceous and Triassic dinosaur fossils? Uh, Cretaceous, uh, please. Uh, can you repeat? Cretaceous and Triassic dinosaur fossils. Uh, uh, if when you compare, uh, even to say the number of uh, dinosaur taxa from Triassic to Cretaceous, is it the question? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Triassic is in fact around 230 million years ago the first dinosaurs appear. And so in the beginning the diversity is not so high, but it's only in the Jurassic that the diversity has increased substantially. And this diversity continued even in the Cretaceous. So in the end Cretaceous, late Cretaceous, also the diversity is very high. But when you come to the close of the close to the boundary, that is about three meters below the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, we find that the number of dinosaur bones decrease uh, drastically. So we find only one or two bones below three meters, at, at three meters below the boundary. After that, we don't find any fossils. So there is a, a drastic change in the number of bones that are present from in the uh, end of the Cretaceous, at the end of the Cretaceous. So we don't see uh, sudden diversity change uh, at the end of the Cretaceous, but slowly uh, just below the boundary, we see the change. Okay, sir, thank you. That indeed is something to ponder over. Thank you, Sanjana. Finally, we have Tanya with her query. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was quite an informative session delivered by you. As you stated that uh, the key part, uh, key, uh, the, the uh, as you stated about the dinosaur, so, sir, I would like to ask you that how the discovery of Asplesaurus is considered to be a major push in the evolutionary st uh, studies as we compare to that of the dinosaurs. Which one? Which one you are talking about? Sir, so I am talking about the comparison, the significant characteristics of the Asplesaurus. Oh, what is the name you said? Asplesaurus, sir. Uh, I didn't get it. Sir, so I am asking that what significant characteristics of the Asplesaurus is Asplesaurus. considered... Asplesaurus. What is, what is Asplesaurus? Asplesaurus? Is called, uh, what characteristics uh, does no, no, it... I, I didn't uh, get the... Uh, you're talking about a genus, some genus. Yes, sir. So I am asking that what all gene composition or the significant characteristics of this uh, Ashley Solid genus is considered to be a major evolutionary push in the evol uh, studies of dinosaurs. Could you elaborate on that, please? Can you speak okay. the genus name? ASI. Uh, Tanya, in, can you please type it in the chat box instead? Okay. Okay. Thank uh, you. Asmisaurus. Asilisaurus. Asilisaurus. So, <laughs> I'm, uh, in fact, uh, uh, most of the youngsters, they know more names of the dinosaur species than me. Uh, I, I, I have not uh, heard about this name. 
so i cannot comment about it is is it from uh, cretaceous yes sir uh, cretaceous period yes sir so from where it is reported uh your uh, your uh, your microphone is muted hello uh, where from it is reported uh, it has been reported in uh, europe uh, a book on uh, vertebrate paleontology has stated about it uh, by the author robert so uh, i want to um, I, I don't know because uh, as far as i know uh, most yes. of the books uh, acylosaurus uh, i have not heard about the name and also if if it, it has something to contribute to the phylogeny of the dinosaurs uh, to, it would have been discussed um, in several textbooks so i i have not seen it I, I, so i cannot comment on it yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so we really appreciate your patience in uh, answering all our questions Uh, so once again we thank you for your persistence coming to our today's webinar thank you for taking out time ms your busy schedule i would now like to hand over to dr kamalji dabas ma'am for to present a vote of thanks okay i think now we are uh, done with the queries and they are very well explained by our esteemed uh, uh, sir and uh, now we have also come to the end of the session and so on behalf of the department of zoology i express my heartfelt thanks to our esteemed uh, professor jiva jiva sir who gave us the opportunity to listen to his knowledge and explain the knowledge of the subject this has been definitely an enlightening and encouraging experience to not only us and also to all our students so i hope sir that you will be uh, guiding the students in future as well however our principal uh, hasn't joined us today somehow but still a uh, special mention to him that he has always been uh, a catalyst and uh, being very inspiring during all these events but somehow he couldn't join today but still thanks to him and i also thank the faculty members of the department of zoology especially the dr vivek negi and ops singh yadav and student coordinators like rohini shreha and others who has uh, done untiring efforts to make this event successful finally i would like to thank all the participants my colleagues as well as the students for being very cooperative and a wonderful uh, you know the audiences so i thank everyone for being with us today during this event and making it a great success and thanks to you sir once again thank you very much thank you madam it was a pleasure talking to the students same here sir thank you thank you, okay. thank you ma'am the event was indeed impeccable times are hard but we can always do our best so i would like to request everyone to please switch on their cameras for a virtual snapshot thank you i would once again request all the attendees to find the link attached for the feedback form and fill it in order to claim their e certificates once again thank you everyone for your participation uh, okay ma'am can we end the session ma'am Yes, we can end it with it. Okay, okay. Thank you, so ma'am. You have taken all the screenshots and all that. I hope so. Right, ma'am. Right. Yes, ma That's fine then. So it's all for today, students. Thanks everyone for the cooperation they have made for today. So yes, okay, till we make uh, meet next. Right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Sir.